Hey everybody. Today we're talking about multiple linear regression in R. This is a big complicated topic with lots of subtleties as we shall see. I've already loaded up a few essential packages, tidyverse of course, ggalley which we're going to use to get a preliminary set of plots on our data, and broom, which I don't think I'm actually going to use in this vid, but it's hugely helpful for tidying up the output of our linear models. I at least want to um, to have it on my screen there as we go forward. I'll throw together a, a whole video on that package at one point or another. I'm going to be working with some simulated data today. You can see the, um, the code used to create that data there on the left. I'm not really going to talk about that code, but it's there if you want to um, recreate what I'm doing. What we have here are 60 observations on three variables, two explanatory variables, x1 and x2, and a response variable y. And we'd like to get a model for y on the basis of x1 and x2. Let's start by looking at the assumptions of a multiple linear regression model. The math is there on the first line. y is being modeled as a linear function of the explainers x1, x2, and so on. Here p is representing the number of explanatory variables. Um, so it's essential that the data actually does have a linear relationship between y and those explaining explanatory variables. Here beta naught is an intercept term. So if all the explanatory, vari explanatory variables were equal to zero, what would we expect from our y? And the other coefficients beta, beta one and beta two in our present circumstance are representing slopes. So if x1 changes by one unit, what kind of change are we expecting in y? And if x2 changes by one unit, what kind of change are we expecting in y in that situation? A few assumptions. First of all, the error terms should be normally distributed. Um, that's encoded here by the random component epsilon sub i. Next, we're assuming that, the, um, that those normal distributions don't depend on the values of the explanatory variables. This is what we call homoscedasticity, quite a mouthful. Um, in this simple model that I have up top, we're assuming that the variables x, i do not interact. That is, the influence of one of the variables isn't affected by the values of the other variables, the other explanatory variables. Finally, just as a general statement, we should always watch out for outliers in our statistical modeling. Those can drastically um, change the models that we get. Okay, so before we start, um, creating a multiple linear regression model here. We want to get a preliminary set of plots to see that multiple linear regression is um, even provisionally justified. And so the command here I'm going to use is gg pairs from the ggalley package. And all we have to do is feed that the data frame. The data frame here has three variables, x1, x2, and y. And so we're going to get back a three by three grid comparing each of those variables in pairs. Here I'm most interested in the relationship between x1 and y and x2 and y. So those are the two plots on the bottom left. In particular, I'm seeing um, what appears to be a linear relationship in each case. Additionally, I see that the spread of the y values doesn't seem to be determined, doesn't seem to be dependent on the value of x1 or x2. So provisionally, I'm ready to do um, a, a linear model here. I feel like that may just be justified in this situation. So I'm going to start a new section here with Command Shift R and type in the actual name of it. How about the model? OK, so um, the syntax we're going to use here is LM. And then we're going to put the response variable first, then a tilde, and then the explanatory variables separated by pluses to indicate that we are doing an additive model here. Um, let's see here. Right now, R doesn't know where to look for these variables, so we need to specify that we're looking in the data frame df. Also notice that I've saved the output with the name model so that we can do stuff with it later. So for instance, let's start by getting just a summary of that model. Summary of model. There we go. We get lots of information out, starting with just a refresher of what this model is actually modeling, what the call was. I'm going to talk about most of the stuff over here, but before we do that, I want to do some diagnostic plots. I want to look a little more carefully um, at the output of this model visually to see if those assumptions that we initially laid down are actually 
um, holding here. So the command here is plot the model. So plot model. So model is the name of the model here. This is going to be graphics and base R. So we shouldn't expect a lot of beauty. These are going to be functional, not for communication. We're going to get back a sequence of four plots, and R is going to interactively ask us to sequence through them. So first, we're going to get a residual plot. On the horizontal axis, we have the fitted values, and on the vertical axis, we have residuals. Here, we would like to see that red line be as horizontal as possible um, to indicate that the only variation, variation left in our data is, um, is due to the unexplained error. We'd really like to see a cloud here. We'd like to see not, in, not see any particular patterns in the spread as we move from left to right either. All right, next up is our normal QQ plot. So here we're checking to see whether those residuals really do have um, a normal distribution. If that's the case, then we would see a plot here that adheres pretty closely to the line y equals x. Now I will say that a QQ plot is a pretty heavy-handed tool, and unless the, the variation from the normal is pretty extreme, you won't see a whole lot of variability here. So do take this with a bit of a grain of salt. I have a whole vid on QQ plots. I'll throw a link up top. Next up is our scale location plot. So again, we're getting fitted values on the horizontal axis. This time we're getting the square root of the standardized residuals on the vertical axis. So roughly speaking, again, a measure of how far the individual values are from that regression line, from that linear model. Um, so what we're doing here is checking for that homoscedasticity. And what we would like to see is a relatively horizontal line with no particular patterns in this data. Finally, we have a residuals versus leverage plot. Here we're really looking for outliers. I'm not going to say a whole lot about this one here because um, what we're really looking for is kind of extreme values that will be set apart by a red dotted line that's denoting Cook's distance at a, at a certain threshold. Um, because here I've generated the data from a normal distribution to start, we're not seeing a whole lot of extreme outliers. In particular, we're not seeing any with a lot of leverage. So we're going to move on right past that. Suffice it to say, this data set doesn't have any outliers of concern. Okay, so now let's go back to the summary of the model and talk about this sum. First of all, we just have our five number summary of our residuals. Um, the first thing I really want to focus on, though, is the coefficients block. In particular, we're getting estimates for our intercept. That's our beta naught. That's what we expect from our response variable if all the explainers are equal to zero. Then we're getting estimates for our beta 1 and beta 2 for our respective slopes. So if x1 increases by 1 unit, we expect y to increase by 4.15 units. And if x2 increases by 1 unit, we expect y to decrease by 2.66 units on average. Importantly, those are all assuming that the other variables are still left in the model. So um, when we talk about what the effect of x1, we are leaving x2 in the model. In the second column here, standard errors, we're getting a measure of the variability or reliability um, of those estimates. How, what kind of spread should we expect on those based on the spread of the data? The p-value there in the far right-hand corner is incorporating both of those pieces of information and testing a null hypothesis that the corresponding coefficient is equal to zero here. So here we can see that we don't have strong evidence that the intercept in this model um, isn't equal to zero, but we do have strong evidence that each of the individual slopes are not equal to zero. Um, standard warning, warning about p-values is that you should um, always report your estimate and your standard error, not just the p-value, because those can be misleading under many circumstances. At the bottom, we have some summary data about the model as a whole. In particular, you see an F statistic with a corresponding p-value that's testing the null hypothesis that there's actually a multiple linear relationship between these variables. The residual standard error, multiple R squared, and adjusted R squared are all different measures of the um, spread of the data about the linear model. So um, you could say it's how good a fit is the model to the data, but bear in mind that some of these measures do take into account the variability of the data itself. 
Okay, so one important thing to be able to do with any sort of statistical model is to make predictions based on it. So let's uh, let's do that. Let's start a new section for predictions. And um, in particular, I had coded in earlier another data frame called new data. This time it just has two variables, just the explanatory variables x1 and x2 for 20 different values. And so what I would like to do is to get the response y for each of those combinations of x1 and x2 as predicted by this model. So the basic command we're going to use is predict. First we pass it the name of the model and then the data frame that we're interested in, so new data. It's important that the explanatory variables in the new data frame here, x1 and x2, have the same names as the explanatory variables in the model, x1 and x2. Um, so if I just hit enter right now, I'm going to get out a vector of length 20, which is not really what I want here. So um, how about we call these fitted values? Um, for the predictions that is. And then let's add that to this data frame that we have. So how about new data dollar, how about predict pred for predicted is going to be equal to those fitted values. And then let's just take another look at the new data set. Okay, so we have added a column here with the predictions corresponding to each of the combinations of explanatory variables. For instance, when x1 is equal to 120 and x2 is equal to 100.1, I predict that the response variable y will be equal to 193. Um, the last thing that I really want to do here is to consider um, or to notice some of the open questions here. There's um, a lot of assumptions in our model so far, a lot of things, a lot of possibilities that we've ignored. Let's, ex let's address those directly before moving, before wrapping up this vid. So, of course, we've done a multiple linear model. So what if the relationship between the response variable and the explanatory variables isn't actually linear? Are we just completely out of luck in this environment? The answer ends up being no. What if some of the explanatory variables are categorical? Are we out of luck? Again, the answer is no. What if the variability of the response variable depends on the values of one or more of the explanatory variables? That is, what if our data is actually heteroscedastic? What can we do in that situation? What if some of the explanatory variables are correlated with one another? In other words, do we really need all of the variables um, in this model, or would a simpler version do? Finally, what if the random component of our model doesn't have a normal distribution? That could happen in, in many real-life situations. Um, again, are we out of luck with a linear... Uh, um, a multiple linear regression model, and in this situation we'd be moving more towards a generalized linear model.